thanks for inviting me to the session. Um, just by way of a bit of background, I actually graduated from an undergraduate archaeology degree from Reading in uh, 1985, and since then I've been a, a computer scientist. So this talk will be something a bit different. Um, but my research in computer science is in this topic of uh, artificial intelligence planning, and um, I see uh, some relevance. Uh, I recently read this excellent book in which uh, Juan Barcelo is talking about inverse problems and the difficulty of solving these. So inverse problems <clears throat> are where the answer is known but the question isn't known and you want to do some reasoning backwards from something that you observe to the possible causes of that phenomenon. And these, as he points out, are amongst the hardest problems to solve in applied science uh, because obviously as you reason back, everything branches and there are many, many different possible explanations for every detail. And so there are, he says, no scalable methods yet for solving these problems. Um, so in computer science, we have <clears throat> a causal reasoning method called automated planning. And this is where my research lies. Automated planning is uh, all about trying to understand cause and effect and trying to explain uh, what we can observe. And I thought that the, our techniques from computer science might be of some relevance in archaeology. So uh, I want to start just by telling you what automated planning is and then give you a, a very simple uh, example from a computer game called Settlers, which is um, something simple and understandable. I hope you'll forgive me the trivial example, but I hope it will make some things clear. So uh, automated planning is a method in computer science for generating sequences of actions that will transform some current state or initial state into a state satisfying some goal that needs to be achieved. Um, and in my work, we are usually looking at uh, taking an initial state that is the state now and then constructing sequences of actions that can be executed by robotic devices to achieve some, some goal in the future. So we're usually talking about plans being executed by robotic systems or by cyber systems or by human operators who are operating machinery in dangerous situations and need to be told precisely what to do and how long to do it for and under what conditions to do it and so on. <clears throat> um, and in order to make a planner find these plans, we provide a model of the capabilities of the agent that's going to do the executing of the plan. Um, and this contains the, what actions that agent can perform, but also the resources the agents will have available, uh, the durations of the actions and uh, the, the sort of causal importance of the actions. And then planning searches this enormous combinatorial space for sequences of actions to produce the goal state. And the idea here is that a goal state could be an observed state that we want to explain and the current state be some state in the past that we hypothesize might have existed. And then planning could construct a sequence of actions which would play the role of a causal explanation for how we went from the initial state to the state that we want to explain. So now I need to do a little bit of, uh, well, so first of all our example, and then I will need to do a little bit of technical explanation. <clears throat> so Settlers is a computer game um, in which you have some humans who come to settle some rural area, and they have some, they have their human labor, they also perhaps have some tools, and uh, they start off in a, perhaps a mountainous wooded area uh, where they may have very rudimentary settlement and perhaps that is the state at some point in the past and maybe what we now observe is evidence of some infrastructure, social infrastructure including maybe railways or uh, you know uh, complex structures like tunnels, towns, houses and so on and we perhaps want to understand how that state could have been achieved from this early initial state in which there, were just, there was just a potential for that. Um, so what would be needed for these settlers to reach this kind of uh, settled state would be resources such as iron ore, stone, coal, timber, some way of transporting resources around and of course human labour, more than two people, um, some labour that could be coordinated into these complex tasks of construction. Uh, but then also actions such as building quarries, felling timber, mining ore, building ironworks and so on. And you can see that um, the, these components here are 
elements of the models that we build to explain the capabilities of the agents who have acted to produce the gold state that we're now observing. And I've chosen here to represent actions at the level of groups, what groups of people would do rather than what individual people would do. <clears throat> but of course one could represent the actions of each individual, but then the actions that would then lead from the primitive state at the beginning to this more industrialized state would be very fine-grained and we would really not have a scalable uh, problem. So this is a choice, however, so I just uh, indicate that we have a choice about what we model and how we model it. And then having decided what these component capabilities are, what the resources are that these uh, these um, laborers would have used, then we can talk about, well, how would we start in that initial state and make progress towards the, the goal? So um, we have formal representations and we have uh, logics of action and change. So this is an example of a representation of the initial state of the world. So in uh, automated planning, a state is represented as the set of facts that are true and the quantities, the metric quantities available using whatever units and whatever uh, level of representation is desired. So for example, here we have that location zero, which is the name of the place where they start off, is mountainous and wooded. Um, and that there are tools available at location zero, there's a cabin available at location zero, there's a certain amount of timber available for use, 10 units of it, obviously we're free to choose our units but I'm keeping it simple, and then many other facts. <clears throat> and of these facts that I've listed, these two we might call static facts in the sense that the location will remain mountainous and wooded however we use it, but the other facts are things that can be changed by the application of action. So tools can be moved, cabins can be uh, demolished, uh, timber, the available timber can be increased or reduced. So these are facts that are changed by the application of actions. And then we, we look at the actions that we've modeled as being possible and we decide which of those actions are applicable in this state. And for example, if building a cart requires there to be timber available and some tools, then we can build a cart at location zero. And that will lead us then into a new state in which much of the information is still the same, all the static things are the same, and we haven't moved tools or demolished cabins, but we have now um, reduced the amount of available timber because we've used some of it to build the cart. And we now have a cart available that we didn't have before at that location. So we've entered a new state and from this state we could do another action which might be, for example, to move the cart to a new location. And when we do that move, we then have our cart available at the new location. So the location of the cart has changed. And then these two actions are a sequence of actions that take us from our initial state to one in which we have a cart now at a different location. And it's a trivial example, but it gives you an idea of how we start in a state and then we can apply actions to produce new states and a chain of states that will ultimately, if our model contains enough detail, will lead us to um, something that represents what we can currently see. So before I talk about the planning process, the formal language that we have for describing action is like a programming language and I've abstracted all the sort of code out of it to present you with this sort of uh, representation. This is how you define an action and obviously this is a trivial one. But this is a, a durative action, meaning that when we move a cart it takes some time to have its effect. It has parameters which are the cart that we're going to move, the starting location which we call from and the ending location the destination which I've called to. And then we say how the duration of that action is defined. Here I've decided to make it a function of the weight of the cart and the distance to be travelled. But Of course we can freely decide how the duration of an action is defined. And then any action has both preconditions which are the things that must be true in the current state and effects which are the things that produce the successor state. <clears throat> so when we move a cart the precondition is that the cart is at the starting point and there's a way of getting from the starting point to the destination. And the effect is that the cart immediately leaves the starting point and over the duration it's traveling but then it ends up in the destination. 
So we see this kind of simple state transition where you've started in a state with, for example, a cart at Bradford Forster Square, and there's a route from that station to the Richmond building. You then move the cart. It takes, let's say, 15 minutes. It's not a very heavy cart. Um, and you enter a state where the cart is now at the Richmond building. So this thing, these things are variables of different types, as I mentioned, and this thing here, the action, is what causes the transition from state A to state B. <clears throat> okay, so if we, were, if we started in this initial state of the world and built the cart, as I mentioned before, then we would enter that state that we just saw, but equally we might not do that action we might fell timber at the location or we might build a quarry at the location or we might do many many other things at the location any actions that we've modeled as capabilities of the agents that are applicable because their preconditions are satisfied in this state could in principle be applied and then from each of those states we can apply many other actions and you can see that this eventually produces a potentially infinite search space so now we have a problem, which is that in the first example I showed you, there was just one action and then another action that's kind of trivial. But here now you begin to see that this thing branches. It's a branching process and it's very complex and it's huge. And there isn't any way a priori that you could say what was the, what was the path through that search space that was definitely <coughs> followed by agents executing actions to achieve the goal state. So in order to search that space, we need some kind of automated system that has intelligence in it that allows it to use uh, preferences and um, assumptions to guide its search through that combinatorial space. So what planning does is it searches for a sequence of actions to transform an initial state into a goal state over time. And it's suitable when there are long chains of, of causality involved and interdependencies. So for example, when we see that uh, resources were produced, like timber was felled, for example, now, and then much later it was used, we can see that there was some deliberate intention to produce the resources and later use it. And these are causal interdependencies. And when we, when we have those, or we expect to have those, then planning is a, a useful uh, technology. And we've seen that we generate this massive state space with our goal state, the state we want to explain at the bottom there, the red one. And now we have actions with preconditions that are applicable when they're preconditions, sorry, that, that determine when the actions are applicable and effects that give us a state update. And then uh, we have some method for choosing between the states because the state, the state space is so massively combinatorial we have to have a way of deciding which way to go in it and we make our choices automatically until a point is reached where the uh, goal state has been reached or explained and there may be other sequences of actions that also explain the state and this is where we need some way of comparing states to decide which of those we prefer and it may be that many times in computer science we will generate multiple different plans and then decide which of those is most suitable to a specific situation and in in explanation you might generate different plans and then say well uh, this plan is more interesting for whatever reasons and there may even be intermediate states along the path that you could then say well the, this plan says that I should expect to see this evidence um, at you know this uh, this much time after the initial state uh, held and I could actually go there and see whether that evidence is in the record and then if it is then that corroborates that plan so there are ways in which a plan might be actually useful for um, testing hypotheses so in computer science, the assumptions that are made for planning are the following. So we assume that change is brought about by one or more agents acting in the world. We assume that the world can be modeled as a collection of facts and quantities, and that actions cause the facts to be made true or false and the quantities to increase or reduce. We also work on the basis of um, <clears throat> assuming that all change is deliberate. Everything that's done has a purpose behind it and that our job is to discover the situations in which that purposeful activity is, is, is uh, performed. And we're doing everything to try to achieve the goal state that we're trying to observe. So, so we're going to be looking at change that gets us towards that goal state from our hypothesized initial state. And then we also assume that change is deterministic. That is, we don't reason deliberately about 
uh, probabilities. We don't reason explicitly about probabilities because once you put probabilities into this type of combinatorial search, it becomes unmanageable. And also, we don't usually know what are the processes that led to the uh, distributions that we that we find. And therefore, usually we make uh, assumptions like that distributions are normal or something that don't actually work, and that can give us quite bad quite bad results. So we use a deterministic model of change in this field. And we also assume that states, if I give you two states, there is a way of comparing them to decide which one is the most uh, promising in terms of an explanation. Okay, so the way that <clears throat> forward search planning works in computer science is you start in the current state, you do this generation of successor states by the application of actions, you then evaluate all of these using some kind of uh, heuristic evaluation to, to enable a comparison of these states. You can then pick the best one, you then apply the action to update the state and you record the action as being part of the plan that is being constructed. And this is a method which is now very well researched in computer science and there are stable and robust software systems that perform this type of reasoning. <clears throat> okay, so to take us back to the settlers problem, um, the little example, if we start off with our, our uh, primitive state and uh, we want to reach this industrialized state at the bottom, then we explore this massive branching search space and the green path that you see is a possible plan for explaining how that industrialized state came about. And of course, this relies completely on us having built in our assumptions about what actions could be done and why they might be done. And if we, for example, consider um, the uh, concealed shoe thing that we, the Kerry's talk, which I found fascinating. Um, you might say, well, if what we're trying to explain is some collection of con concealed shoes, could we use a plan to take us from some hypothesized initial state to one in which these shoes are present? And the answer is yes, provided you can model in to the actions that people, uh, you think people would have performed, the, the expectations for why they might have concealed shoes. What was the purpose of doing it and how might those purposeful activities combine into a plan for explaining a rich assemblage. So the answer is yes, you can build a plan as long as you can model the component activities, preferences and assumptions that, uh, that you're basing all of your interpretation on. So if planning is a fully automated process, I want to emphasize this because um, it's not always clear to non-computer scientists. We have a code which is an automated planning system. What we have to provide as input is this formal representation of the what we call the domain, which is all of the actions that can be performed and all of the predicates and functions that are being used to describe the facts and quantities. And then, and then similarly, a description of the initial and goal states. PDDL that you see there is our formal language for doing these descriptions. And then these are the inputs to this automated planning system. Out comes a linear sequence of timed parameterized actions. And what you see here is the components of this plan. The number down the left is the time point at which the action is applied. It's a relative time point relative to the start of the, the plan, time zero, which is when we're at the initial state. Then we have the action with its parameters. And at the end, in square brackets, we have the duration of the action. And this is obviously a trivial example, but hopefully you can see how this might represent a, um, a plan that gets us from an initial state to a goal state based on the causal models that were supplied. Okay, so what can planning do for you or others in uh, non-computer science domains? Well, you can formalize your assumptions about the capabilities and resources available to the agents. You can specify the goal state that needs to be explained by describing it and hypothesize the initial state from which you think this was constructed. And that initial state could be, you know, some time ago. We don't place any expectations on what the time periods are. It's up to the modeler to decide the time granularity. 
The key thing is you don't know the answer in advance. You just know what some of the components are. And the planner's job is to combine those components in all of the, the actually logically possible ways. And the, the result can be very surprising. We find this in robotics as well, that a plan can propose really interesting collections of activities that we wouldn't have thought of as, as the human operator. So in archaeology, that might correspond to uh, the plan identifies intermediate states that you actually want to go and check because they look plausible and interesting and you haven't thought of them arising in this way. Um, they might also reveal flaws in assumptions. So you might, as a result of constructing a plan, think, no, that's that's silly. I didn't, I forgot to say, you know, these constraints or I forgot to model these types of actions that could be applied. And you can then go back and revise, revise assumptions. And the, the interesting thing here, and the reason why I thought I'd come and tell you about this, is because planners and support tools are freely available on the web. So if anybody wanted to actually try modeling an archaeology domain, um, in PDDL and try a planner, then that would be an obvious uh, interdisciplinary collaboration to try to do that. And the planner would be just downloaded and run once those models were constructed and it could be a, an interesting way to explore a, a new uh, possibility. So just for conclusions, um, a plan solves an inverse problem of the type that Barcelo explained, how the observed state was produced from something that came before. And in his uh, chapters in that book, he does in fact talk about having causal models of action and effect and how these might be explored. So I think this is very much along the lines that, uh, that he was talking about. The method here that I'm describing is somewhat scalable in the sense that we can produce plans of hundreds of actions or even more, but it does depend on the model being um, not not so fine-grained that the branching factor of the search space is too immense and the states are not really comparable because they're all too similar. So there is a real modeling task here. It's difficult to do modeling for planning, but with the help of experts, it's, it's uh, entirely possible to do it. And then um, plans, as I've mentioned, pass through interesting intermediate states, which could set up sub-goals to be explored. They also allow concurrent activity. You might have noticed that the plan had several actions happening at the same <laughs> time point. They appear as a linear sequence, but they may be actually executed concurrently. Mm -hmm. And I haven't discussed it here, but planning can model and exploit um, physical processes and interactions. And as I mentioned, we have software in existence that, that could be tried. Okay, thank you very much.